uh, joining from London. Uh, so we are we are happy to see you, team. Our partner team, Dangori. Thank you so much. I want now to take this uh, back to Victor Capio. Uh, Victor is our um, cybersecurity lead at Kicktonet, and he will take us uh, in the next steps. Karibu, Victor. Um, thank you very much, Grace, and thank you everybody for making time to attend this session. Uh, we'd like to go to the next bit of the uh, meeting, which basically is to hear the perspectives from uh, the various experts who are present with us today. So first, I'd like um, to have them introduce themselves. Um, you can turn your video on, uh, the presenters, and then uh, just say your name, uh, your organization, and you can also tell us why you're passionate about uh, cyber security. So we'll start with Joseph, uh, Dr. Paula, and then Model Philip, uh, Honorable Kisang, and then Dr. Vikit uh, in that order. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor. Uh, my name is Joseph Nzano. Um, I work at the Communications Authority of Kenya. Particularly so, I work uh, as the uh, head of the cyber security department and also the head of the Kenya Computer Incidents Response Team, that is uh, KESAT. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to be with you today. And of course, cyber security is my passion. Uh, I've been having uh, working in this sector for a couple of years now. And indeed, we work on a day-to-day basis to ensure that uh, our, our country is cyber safe. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Dr. Paula. Thank you, Victor. And good morning to you all. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Gigi and uh, the KICTANET uh, team, Asanteni. Uh, my name is Paula Musuva. I'm a faculty member lecturer at uh, USIU. Um, and uh, you said we, we explain why we are passionate about cybersecurity. Well, I'm a techie at heart, uh, started with a computer science background, uh, specialized in network systems. Uh, I enjoy technology. I think for me, what is more important is that I've learned that uh, you need to be able to use technology in a relevant and innovative way uh, to solve real issues for real people. And I'm really passionate about that. That's what uh, gets me up every morning. Uh, I also love working with the youth um, and I consider myself as somebody who's contributing to raising the next generation or the current generation. They say the future is now, right? Uh, of cybersecurity professionals. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself a mentor uh, in that regard, especially to the women. Yes, so I'm here to just share a few ideas in this area, Asanteni. All right. Thank you, um, Mutia. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to the Kitten team for having us here. Um, I am a cybersecurity, counterterrorism, and crisis management lawyer. Although I, was, I have a background in central bank uh, regulation. And why am I passionate about cybersecurity? Cybersecurity, as everybody thinks about it, is more the technology side. So long, we've been slow to play catch up to cybersecurity. So on the global stage, we're currently very few formally trained lawyers. And the reason I jumped onto this bandwagon is that without laws, there's anarchy. You know, I have this thing I say, even in the Bible, the first law was do not eat the fruit of the tree. And once they ate the fruit of the tree, there was anarchy. So um, I'm here to, I'm passionate about cybersecurity because it's the next frontier and we need to secure it. If we have no laws, there's anarchy. And so uh, laws start from policy. So I love interacting with other policy makers to understand what is there so that we know how to regulate it. And I'm looking forward to engaging discussions. Fantastic. Um, Philip? I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my CEO, uh, Distinguished guests, members available here. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Philip Pirode. I work at the ICT Authority as the head of information security. And uh, of course, I'm equally passionate about uh, cybersecurity. 
I've uh, been in this industry for the past, uh, I think, 12 years, having started from the private sector and uh, currently heading cybersecurity uh, at the ICT authority. Um, I look forward to this engagement and uh, as part of the ICT authority, we have a responsibility in ensuring that actually, as uh, the government looks towards uh, adopting digitization, providing citizen services through the digital platform, they are assured of the infrastructure that is built, they are, you know, their privacy, their transactions are secured, and I will look forward to contributing here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, we then have Honorable Kisan. Don't know if you can hear us. Uh, while we're still uh, connecting, maybe we can have uh, Dr. Kate Kitao if uh, Honorable Kisang is not available now. Um, good morning, uh, colleagues, friends. Uh, my name is Catherine Gitao. Uh, I'm the CEO of the ICT Authority for the next two weeks uh, until uh, I start my retirement. Uh, although I shall not retire from cybersecurity and cyber hygiene and uh, other activities that I am passionate about. Um, why am I passionate about those activities? I have observed alongside uh, other Kenyans uh, how ICT has transformed lives and uh, how much of our uh, economic, social, uh, and even political life uh, is depending upon a safe and secure use of the technology. And therefore, I'm equally passionate about cyber hygiene, which is where we take our own responsibility for uh, keeping a secure environment and cyber security where people like uh, Joseph and Philip uh, assist us to recover uh, when the attack happens. We can't conceptualize a life without uh, an army, a police force, uh, doctors, and other people who keep us safe, safe and secure in the physical realm. And I think we need to start thinking about the cyber realm in the same way. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I look forward to engaging with all those present. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari, for um, joining us today. And I don't know whether we have um, Honorable Kisang uh, back online. Okay, um, so we'll we'll proceed with the session. So um, during the uh, session, we want to Peter, find out. Yes. Uh, I think you forgot to give uh, Dr. Koyabe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Koyabe, sorry, uh, please um, introduce yourself. And um, yes, why are you, which, which organization and why are you passionate about cybersecurity? Okay, first of all, let me thank the organizers for this particular event and uh, Grace, thanks to you. Uh, thank you also for making me meet some very, very useful colleagues and mentors and past colleagues and very many uh, enthusiastic uh, cybersecurity experts here. Uh, my name, for those of you whom we've never met, uh, is Dr. Martin Koyabe. Uh, I know most of you have said you're enthusiastic about cybersecurity, but some of us will got scars to show how enthusiastic we are. But uh, just coming back to the point, I think, uh, and if I recall, when we started working with uh, Kenya, it has been very, very uh, useful for me uh, to be able to engage at various levels. Um, I do work for the uh, Global Forum uh, on Cyber Expertise. Uh, we are based at The Hague, uh, and we are also working with a lot of uh, African Union member states, uh, all the 54 African Union member states, under the project called the AU GFCE Collaboration Project, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, but before that, I think there are a number of issues that we need to look at when it comes to cyber. 
uh, cyber is becoming more of a, an engaging field. Uh, it's morphing quite a bit and it's challenging. There are three things that I think we need to take into consideration as we look at cyber. And these are very challenging issues. The first one is the issue around the disruption that uh, we are seeing from time to time. Our over-dependency in the digital infrastructure and the digital nature as shown by COVID gives us that element of vulnerability. So therefore the likes of uh, Nzanu and his team uh, at CA are very useful to look at how we make sure that we protect our infrastructure. And then of course, uh, Ekikta does very useful work for making sure that they engage stakeholders like ourselves and others to come together so that we can talk about these issues. And then of course, you've got other participants and I've seen uh, participants from other institutions who have an interest in terms of making sure that we can see that disruption is minimized. The second issue, which is very critical, is what we are seeing as the, the, the distortion of information, the, you know, the, the fake news and other issues that are very difficult to really protect. And for those of you whom I know do study quite a bit, uh, Dr. Kate is here, so I have to be very careful whom I quote. Uh, people like, for example, we've seen that there are studies out there that show that uh, fake news, for example, spread six times faster than normal news. So you can imagine the problem that we have ahead. And then, of course, you know how much it can cause a lot of discomfort in the community and, 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 uh, you know, and other issues. And then thirdly, is the issue of our deterioration in terms of trusting what we have today and how difficult it is for regulators to be able to deal with what is emerging as uh, emerging technologies. So if you think of a regulator who is trying to regulate a technology that sits on one hand, it's uh, maybe a transport uh, technology, and on the other hand, it's a telecom technology, it is very difficult. So therefore, for those of us who are here who are regulators, find it very challenging to really regulate in those kind of spaces. And that doesn't mean that the adversaries or the people who do harm are out there to do exactly what it is. I'll talk a little bit shortly later and we'll see how the North and South can cooperate in terms of collaboration at international level and also how we can enhance cybersecurity in Kenya. So with those few remarks, I really want to thank you, Victor and the team at Kikta and also the Kenyan government and of course, uh, colleagues from the UK government who are here uh, to make sure that they can be able to assist uh, the country to move forward. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari, uh, for those very insightful remarks. We will now proceed to the start of the session. And I know um, we have one last panelist to introduce himself, Honorable Kisang. Please be on standby. Um, so this session, we want to look at some of the priorities, basically we want to stock take uh, what has, you know, for the past three years, we have been working on improving our cybersecurity environment. And it is always important that we compare notes uh, every so often to see whether we're actually moving in the right direction or not. And if not, how do we correct uh, the needle so that we head to the true north, if so to speak. Uh, with respect to cybersecurity, we are all aware that we all have a responsibility to ensure that you know our cyberspace is safe and is safe for you know continues to remain as such, and we continue to build trust and confidence in uh, digital systems. So, without much further ado, I'd like to uh, you know our question that we are trying to you know determine today is what has what have we been able to achieve, and we are going to be hearing perspectives. Uh, on various aspects in terms of uh, the policies, uh, how we done with respect to people, uh, partnerships, uh, what are those priorities that we need to look at, uh, building political will, uh, preparation, and lastly, uh, how do we collaborate uh, between, how do we make the international processes relevant at the local level and the other way around. So I'd like to introduce our first um, speaker who is going to be Honorable Kisang, um, please. Um, you have the floor. Let us try to keep it within uh, seven minutes uh, for all the speakers, and then we'll have uh, a question and answer session uh, at the end uh, of this uh, panel discussion. Um, if you have any burning question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, once again, our, um, our hashtag for the meeting is CyberSecKE, which is also going to be placed in the chat. So Moshima Kisan, please, uh, you have the floor. Uh, Victor. Yes. 
Uh, Honorable oh. Kisang yeah, is, uh, is, is saying, actually, uh, Honorable, I think you have a, a, a challenge because we can't see your microphone. Oh, you can't see it, and I'm seeing everybody else. Yes, you only have the camera, but you don't have the microphone. Maybe, um, can he speak, can people hear as he speaks on my phone? Oh, yeah, mm. I can see it. Okay. Okay, go on now, oh. Honorable Kisang, you're live. Well, good morning, <laughs> all of you. My name is uh, William Kisang, MP Marakwet West. I'm the chair of the uh, Departmental Committee of National Assembly on Communication, Information, and Innovation. I'm sorry, I'm the chair, and technology is uh, messing us up here. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, mine was just to introduce myself and also give uh, briefly that uh, as a committee, we are at the tail end now of uh, this uh, 12th Parliament of uh, Kenya. And for the last four and a half years or so, we worked very well with the sector. We have been able to pass several laws, especially the one on cyber crime, the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crime Act 2019. We actually passed 2018 and there were issues. There are people went to court. And uh, so far, at least the court has been, uh, the court issue has been sorted out. And uh, also Senate recently also went to court to say that there are some laws that were passed uh, at National Assembly and they did not go to Senate and they were challenging the, the laws. But I'm happy to report to the country that basically that case has been thrown out and we are happy the, that uh, basically the implementers, the executive now and the industry should be able to apply the law uh, without any issues. Uh, I know this is a new era, especially on cybersecurity. And as members of parliament, we are ready, we are willing. If there are any challenges with the law, if there are any issues that you believe require amendment, we are there for you. Uh, before the committee also, we have some few amendments that were brought by the former little majority on the river Duale on the child pornography. I know there have been issues because it was not, uh, it was initially not uh, specified as child pornography. And people are saying the, this particular section of the law is taken care of elsewhere. But uh, it's before the committee, you are free to air your views. And we are there for you, we are there for the country. Uh, within the same period, also, at least uh, I'm happy to report to you also that. Uh, as a country now, we have a better protection commissioner in place so that as we sort our, uh, out issues on cyber security, we know so our data is safe. Uh, uh, and you know very well, we are going through an election period. Campaigns have already started uh, and data is uh, paramount. So as a committee, we have engaged with Kicktonet, we have engaged with Kepsa, and we continue to engage. And we want to influence also the executives so that as they come up with new policies on cyber security, anything on cyberspace, we are there to have positive influence. So, Chris, anything else that you had wanted me to speak specifically on? Uh, Victor, do you have questions for for Honorable Kisang? Uh, maybe he can tell us uh, what is what is uh, on his priority list as a uh, parliament other than the cyber crime law. Okay, did you get that question, Honorable Kisang? He said, "What is it? What what is on priority? Uh, what is on priority list as uh, as as, as uh, the ICT committee uh, apart from uh, cyber the, the the cyber crime act?" Oh, there are issues that are also before the committee that came this week. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have been waiting for, but it has not yet seen uh, the light of the day or has uh, arrived in parliament is what we call critical infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. fiber has not been, uh, you know, there are people who don't even know that fiber is as critical as water, as critical as air uh, or oxygen, or as critical as even uh, power. So we are still waiting. The executive uh, looks like uh, there are issues between maybe the, the national security docket and ministerial ICT, but we are following so that if possible, that particular bill comes to the house and pass before 
basically uh, the close of this parliament because by June uh, next year we will break uh, what we call sign and die. Basically, it means uh, parliament will not be on. Mm -hmm. We will go for campaigns until the next parliament resumes. Mm -hmm. But if there is any emergency or anything special that can be discussed, mm -hmm. MPs are there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, with this new constitution, parliament is not closed. Yes. The life of this parliament basically dies uh, midnight 8th of December next year because mm -hmm. the elections are 9th of December. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, that is one of the bills that we are waiting for. Another bill that has come, it was read first time yesterday, mm -hmm. is we have uh, what Media Council Amendment uh, Bill that has come before the House. We are trying to see uh, how we can make some few changes to take the law so that Media Council is really is independent. Uh, we can see if we can have some media funds. Made basically generated by the media owners and media sector, so that you know there is something that can be used even to train journalists, you know, to do things that will help them. And then uh, we also have uh, the public relations society of Kenya. There is a bill that uh, has come to the house. It was read right first time yesterday. We also have a copyright amendment bill. I know the issues. I saw the CEO of Kekobo. Uh, there was some article this week in uh, in the Business Daily on sharing of the resources from uh, this uh, the artists. You know the one by mm -hmm. ten cost, one cost to the those uh, promoting societies. So the bill is before it, it was read yesterday first time, and it has been brought to our committee. And those are the things that we believe we'll discuss between now and uh, February, March next year. Because from next year, March, basically, parliament will be like on uh, on slow mm -hmm. because we'll be campaigning for nominations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic. Anything else? At least, at yeah. least I'm, able to, I'm able to see you now. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing you, but I'm not getting your voice on my yeah yeah your 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 microphone is not on so i think there's a challenge there yeah uh maybe something that you need to sort before june next now that, year now that the majority of Nairobians have been vaccinated now maybe it is going forward also we can engage in pass yes <laughs> yeah the committee is willing uh, to meet with you if there are any issues that you want us to help mm -hmm. the committee is more than willing okay we have a personal engagement whether it's really in Nairobi or a retreat in Mombasa or Naivasha or anywhere we don't have to go to Naiva, uh, Mombasa all the time okay we can visit other, other places parts of the country. okay yes. okay Yes, maybe the last um, comment is on uh, maybe uh, Mushmur can tell us about the ICT practitioners uh, bill. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, we, oh, yeah, that's what I forgot. The, the last parliament, Honorable Duale came up with ICT practitioners bill as, as a sponsor towards the end. I think uh, it was impressed upon to basically withdraw it and it was withdrawn. Now, in this parliament, in the last year or so, Honorable Sotse, a nominated member parliament, who is also a professional, an ICT professional, got up bill again. The public participation, there are, there are challenges, there are issues. All the memorandums, it's only one uh, particular uh, group that supported the bill, but majority of uh, uh, the stakeholders opposed, they are not happy with the bill. We have discussed as a committee, uh, also see as impressed upon members that basically we make this thing optional. It is not a requirement. It's not a mandatory mm -hmm. register so that you can practice. Because we have students, we have lawyers, we have engineers, myself as a double man, mm -hmm. who is a practitioner. So mm -hmm. we, the, the bill is uh, is before the house. It's likely to be, to be debated either next week or next year. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can still lobby. Even myself, I'm not supporting it. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Anything else, uh, Kapio? And I think that's it for now. Okay. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Kisang. Um, you I know you, you about the bill. No, of course you know, and you, we have already made that. 
<laughs> we've made that very clear, uh, including making a submission and yeah. being very vocal about it. Well, the bill is not, it's not, uh, I mean, that is, this is not a sector. We can self-regulate. Yes. Yeah, we can serve the clear three. Uh, well, I'll advise you at the right time so that we can log it to defeat the bill. All right. All right. Fantastic. Thank and you I, so much. And, and I told him I'll not second the bill. Okay. Yeah. So right. he should actually withdraw it if his chairman is not um, supporting it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Honorable Kisang. Uh, right. As we've agreed, I will call you on the follow up issues, uh, okay. especially on appearing on Tech on Tech. Uh, good day. All right. Over to you, uh, Victor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Grace, for facilitating um, that uh, during the session. So we'll continue with the rest of the panelists. Um, next, uh, we'll have uh, Joseph Zano from the CA. Uh, please tell us what has been achieved so far and what are some of the priorities. Uh, you have uh, seven minutes. Thank you, Karibu. Uh, thank you, Victor. So, well, I'm glad that the honorable member actually um, uh, touched on quite a number of issues which uh, I was going to mention as what was achieved. So uh, in the interest of time and, and in saving those seven minutes, perhaps I'll just concentrate on uh, uh, issues which have already not been discussed about. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Kiktanet, of course, and uh, the UK for facilitating this meeting. And this is very noble uh, because such discussions are key and important uh, to always uh, take a pit stop and to review um, where we have come from and where we are going. Um, I recall in 2019, Kiktanet had come up with a policy brief, um, uh, which was uh, uh, just neutral, not very harsh, uh, neither was it too uh, good, but at least it, it gave most of the uh, perspective in terms of policy and be between them and then uh, there's, a, there's a lot of difference, uh, there's a lot of improvements. Uh, and also, unfortunately, in between, uh, as with the focus today, uh, building back better, uh, we had the COVID which came and really disoriented us and uh, it gave us a fast forward in, into zones which we never imagined before. Um, uh, so uh, basically, I think it, it's good to, to look at the history uh, of where all these things started uh, of policy and cybersecurity in Kenya. Well, it started way back in 2005 um, when we started attending uh, ITU meetings. If you recall, the ITU had the global cybersecurity agenda, uh, which uh, our then Minister of ICT signed up as one of the member states, I think around 2009 that as Kenya, we will join more than 153 other states globally uh, towards the agenda of a uh, global cybersecurity agenda, ensuring that uh, each country has some has put some form of uh, measures of protecting ourselves from cybercrime and also enhancing our cybersecurity management. That's why, um, for example, uh, entities like CA, Communications Authority, which is one of the uh, representatives in the ITU, right from 2009-2011 began to uh, uh, look at uh, having various aspects of cybersecurity management, forming departments which will look uh, into this. Uh, and more importantly, around 2009, there was an amendment uh, to the Kenya Information Communications Act. Now, just to, to make it clear to all of us, the Kenya Information Communications Act is what forms the communications authority and gives mandates to all the uh, thing that uh, all the functions that it does. Uh, now, in particularly so, uh, let's concentrate in the area of licensing internet service providers and ensuring that internet service providers are compliant and agree to the various uh, conditions which are provided in the license issued to them. So, so based on that, um, there was an amendment again in 2009, which said that now we need to have, that is section 83C, which says that now the authority needs to uh, facilitate the process of investigation and prosecution of cyber crimes. So that's when we started uh, uh, looking at forming a cyber security department, uh, dedicating personnel towards this initiative. And that's why in 2016, the national case at, uh, K, uh, was, was put in place, was established, and then also uh, uh, now, from since then, we have been running 24-7 operations to date. 
but now back to policies what has been happening then so kika has been holding us all the way right up to about 2013 in 2013 some initiative started of of, of particularly uh, drafting the computer misuse and cyber crimes act and there were three or four initiatives. One, of course, came from Ministry of ICT and the CA was supporting. Another initiative came from CA itself. Another one came from the office of uh, DPP, AG's office. Uh, in, in, in summary, uh, a number of other uh, entities now are, are having, including I think there was an MP was sponsoring uh, a, a bill. We're having almost five to six different versions of proposals of a computer uh, cyber crimes um, act. But uh, through uh, due diligence and intervention of the AG's office, uh, all these players were put together and they drafted the Computer Ministry Cyber Crimes Act, which was completed around 2016, as the Honorable MP has mentioned. And it took about two years of fine tuning before it was finally enacted uh, in uh, 2018. As the MP explained, taken to court, uh, some sections suspended, uh, this was uh, thrown away last year, 2020 in February, uh, again taken to court between the Senate and Parliament. And then as the MP explained, uh, recently it has been uh, uh, again thrown away. So in short, the Computer Mixed with Cyber Crimes Act is now fully operational and uh, implementation should start. And that's why uh, the Ministry of Interior, uh, which is the main sponsor of the act in consultation with the Ministry of ICT, about four weeks ago, uh, they launched the uh, what you call uh, the uh, NC4, which is the National Computer and Cyber Crimes Coordination Committee, um, as enshrined in the Computer Misuse with Cyber Crimes Act. So this committee is supposed to oversee uh, issues of uh, managing cyber security in the country. And it also is supposed to appoint a secretariat, uh, which will support its functions and implement the decisions which are made in the committee. Um, so, uh, uh, slightly we go back again, um, there was the uh, National Cybersecurity uh, Strategy, which was drafted around 2014, and it had a lifespan of five years, which really meant, 2013, sorry, a span of five years, which really meant it was retired around 2018, 2019 there, an initiative which was done by Ministry of ICT, uh, together with the ICT board or currently ICTA and uh, uh, now. And uh, in, in this initiative um, uh, was put to hold so the process of uh, developing a new cybersecurity strategy. And uh, to the best of our understanding, the reason being we needed to give way uh, to the national ICT policy 2020. Uh, of which I really thank Kicktanet uh, and, and among other stakeholders for giving very healthy contributions towards the policy. And finally, it was uh, enacted sometime uh, towards the end of last year, if I'm not wrong, or early this year. And uh, this policy now uh, brought in very new uh, interesting aspects. And I look at it and, and see it, it's, it's more of a lessons learned. It's more of a lessons learned from the various uh, 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 initiatives which have been put right from Kika, uh, right to CMCA, and now having the ICT policy, which even went further to look at particular technologies uh, like mobile fast, looking at skills and innovation, looking at uh, the public service delivery. It also went looking at new trends uh, with regard to uh, cryptography, big data, deep learning, uh, also uh, 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 blockchain, digital currency. Um, uh, name it, all, all, all the, the new things. And also, it also prescribed uh, uh, more aspects within cybersecurity management, including the national public key infrastructure, uh, among other uh, initiatives. It really outlines at a policy level of what the expectations of the government and uh, uh, is in this area. So, um, and then came the Data Protection Act, which is very key because uh, uh, within the evolution of cybersecurity globally, initially the concern was uh, within organizations, entities, companies, how uh, cybersecurity is handled for, for, for key sensitive uh, infrastructures. But as we have continued, and as what uh, COVID has taught us, that now cybersecurity goes right all the way to individuals, right to the devices which you have, that is your phone, your 
tablet, your iPod, uh, your iPad, or 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 your uh, laptop or personal computer, you, you, there's that personalized responsibility for you to uh, ensure that you are safe. And more importantly, also a lot of data has been generated within this period, which of which this data it can easily be misused and be subject to cybercrime and also be a threat to uh, cybersecurity. So that's why the Data Protection Act came into being, Data Commissioner was appointed, and that among the key things which uh, they look at, of course, is uh, uh, ensuring a uh, issue of uh, uh, transparency, integrity and confidentiality, accountability, and now they have come up with a, a number of set of regulations which I think went for, through uh, public participation. And perhaps at this stage, I believe they are going into the final stages of uh, being put into law. Fast forward to now, um, uh, definitely we need to revisit the talk of a uh, national cybersecurity strategy. We need to look perhaps in the next three or four years what we intend to do. The advantage which we have now is that um, there's, there's, there's uh, a, 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 a lot of lessons learned through all these processes of uh, litigation, through all these processes of uh, uh, drafting, which has been done, the various efforts, there's now a better understanding who uh, the stakeholders are. So there's a better stakeholder mapping. So I believe uh, this process now of developing the, the national cybersecurity strategy should be a multi-stakeholder uh, process. And I believe now that NC4, the committee is in place, uh, should be among, uh, it should be in the forefront to, uh, to, to spearhead this process and stakeholder engagement uh, of the same. Uh, Victor, am I almost on my seven minutes? Um, I think uh, you, are, you are at the border. You're I'm at the border, <laughs> yes. So I just wanted to, to end by saying that uh, uh, what is very key now and what has taught us that we don't have so much litigation, uh, stakeholder approach is, is, is the best way to handle things. Uh, we need to uh, have and develop policies, tools of regulation, which one, uh, are robust, and secondly, uh, are operational, and more importantly, thirdly, are sustainable. Uh, thank you very much, Victor, and that's my uh, thoughts for, for, for this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Justin, those are very interesting perspectives. You've given us the historical background. And of course, you're concluding by saying we need to look at the strategy, but also we need to develop those that are robust, operational, and uh, sustainable. Um, for any of the members in the meeting, uh, if you have any questions to uh, Joseph, please uh, put them in the chat. We'll be coming to that at the end of uh, the round of questions. Uh, the hashtag is CyberSecKE. Uh, I can see very many people have joined. We are now 52 in the room. Um, uh, just to recognize, uh, I can see Wamboy Wamunyu, Tim Wiruri, Rosemary, Rosemary Olale, uh, Paul Njeroke, uh, Nicole Gregory, I can see Michael Mushie, Michael Kahindi, you know, very, very uh, many participants who are uh, joining. Please uh, make your comments. I can see Jemima Hodgson. Jojo War, a very good friend for many years. Karibuni uh, sana nyote. We'll move to the next uh, panelist, who's Dr. Paul Musuva, uh, who is also going to, uh, yes. I can just allow us to recognize uh, Jemima uh, Hotkin, who is uh, joining us from London. Uh, Jemima is actually the program manager for UK's uh, uh, global cyber capacity building program and um, part of why we we are meeting and benefiting from that program. Uh, thank you so much, Jemima. I know it's still early in London and we appreciate your time. Over to you, Victor. Thank you. Um, we'll have uh, Dr. Musuba, please. Uh, next, you have uh, seven minutes. Karibu. Thank you and greetings to you all. Uh, as you've been told, and I think we've already introduced ourselves, uh, I'm, I'm an educator and I'll be speaking about people issues. Um, yeah, so thank you for the time. I know I have a limited time, so I'll just uh, jump uh, straight in. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I, I, I want to speak on three main things uh, with regards to people issues. So I tried to condense it just to three points. Uh, number one is values. Uh, number two is cybersecurity skills gap. 
And number three is behavior. So I just wanted to touch on those three. So let me start on the first one, which I believe for me is the most important uh, from a perspective of um, you know, achieving uh, sustainable uh, gains uh, within the area of cybersecurity, and that is values. And I think values is what uh, holds our social fabric. I know some of you guys are shocked that I'm starting with values and we are techie, techie community and people who are uh, striving for different things within this space, uh, cybersecurity space. But I, I really believe that um, you know, having a strong social fabric um, uh, that, that connects us together towards uh, intended end, uh, I think is the best way for us to achieve the outcomes, whichever outcomes we set uh, with regards to our people uh, strategy. And um, I know I, I won't be able to really talk about this. Um, you know, I know you have two questions for me, Victor, but I'll just give you my views and then we'll try and see where they fit in in those two questions. And I think, uh, of course, we can start from the values when we look about when we think about the constitution, our Kenyan constitution. And uh, you know, it exposes quite a number of values uh, with regards to human rights and dignity. And I think those are things to really underscore. And I saw in the policy brief, these are things that have already been highlighted. And I think um, there's also a lot of discussion with, re with regards to values uh, in terms of just uh, integrity, transparency, justice. Justice is even in our national anthem, a sense of justice and service. Uh, these are things that are in our national anthem. And um, I think these are very key things and we really need to check whether we are grounding all our strategies and considering how we may build and espouse these values. Uh, some people may think that the, the generation gone before is already uh, uh, set in its ways, but we could also consider how we could uh, you know, espouse these values in the uh, children as they grow up in schools, uh, right from, you know, kindergarten. Um, I know we used to sing the national anthem. I don't know how regularly it's done anymore in the schools and, um, you know, just, uh, and, uh, you know, just building in a lot of these values that will touch on our ability to achieve uh, a lot of these gains uh, within the cybersecurity space. And I, I really think that this needs to be in the hearts of Kenyans to serve Kenya, uh, not to serve themselves, uh, not to serve their own personal interests, uh, because when you think about a lot of the cybersecurity issues we have, maybe it will be just uh, from, from stemming from that perspective. And also just Africans to really serve Africa. Uh, do we really have a heart for our, our continent? Uh, I know I could speak a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, this is something that I'm, I'm really uh, looking into because Africa is going to be the continent with the largest um, population of youth under the age of uh, 30 uh, in the next few years. Uh, some people look at this, this as our demographic dividend, but some people could consider this as our demographic disaster, depending on how you look at it. And uh, if we don't tap into this youth and uh, you know, uh, have them ready for this phase of, of, of global change that's coming uh, due to technology, I mean, COVID has already accelerated technology transformation seven years ahead or four, four to seven years ahead. That's what some of the uh, researchers are saying. So you can imagine now where we are heading, where we are already uh, four years or seven years in into where we were saying would be the fourth industrial revolution and a huge dependency on technology. Because then now we have a high, higher attack surface. We have a lot more to lose if these systems are compromised. Um, so that's the first one. I think we can always figure out, uh, I have more to say, but because of time, I'll just uh, keep it to that. And uh, I think we also need to transmit these values regardless of profession and regardless of um, specialization. Um, the second is the cybersecurity skills gap. And I think this is a global challenge. Uh, I think every, every other day you'll see a report that touches on this. I think there was one recently uh, about the US crisis, uh, but it's a global crisis. I think in the US, they were basically saying they are short of um, 500,000 unfulfilled jobs, cybersecurity jobs, where the jobs are there, but there are no people to hire. And I think they were also saying uh, for every two cybersecurity jobs they're able to fill, one is empty. So these are the, a third of the cybersecurity jobs that are not filled. 
And they were saying uh, in terms of uh, the inclusion of this 82% of the country's cybersecurity jobs are held by men uh, and uh, white, white men, 80% of those are white men. Um, uh, I, I think, I mean, I can always share the link uh, to that report. Um, I think uh, the Microsoft uh, uh, CEO Satya Nadella was uh, commenting on it the other day on LinkedIn and I got a chance to look at it. Uh, but I think if we look at it even locally, uh, we wrote, uh, uh, I contributed uh, in the um, Serianu uh, report, uh, I believe that was 2019, uh, on the cybersecurity skills gap. And one of the things we were saying basically is that there were, at that time, there were only 1,700 certified professionals, uh, basically people who are skilled and certified within cybersecurity and filling in a cybersecurity role. Um, so effectively, basically contributing to this cybersecurity skills pool. But then we were saying then, even then we were short of uh, uh, cybersecurity talent, what we needed. And I think we were saying even back in 2018 that um, there was only one certified cybersecurity professional for 1,000, uh, sorry, 177,000 in Africa. So one in 177,000. Now, if you compare that maybe with the ratio for doctors, we are saying we have, let's say 25 physicians in Kenya for every 100,000 in the population. Here we're saying we have only one for every 177,000. Um, now, depending on how your, your perspective is on this, um, how you want to evaluate this is in terms of the dependency on uh, digital technologies. The more we are dependent on those digital technologies, the more we need specialists who can set them up. And importantly, because we're talking about this from a cybersecurity forum, secure them. Uh, the thing is with the fourth industrial revolution, we're saying some of the technologies we're gonna be dealing with include cloud technologies, internet of things, that basically increases our attack space. Uh, we're now no longer talking about technology being far out there. With IoT, we are saying this is technology that is integrated in my car, in my home. Uh, if my car brakes fail because somebody hacked into them, that may lead to death, you know? So now we are moving away far, far closer to our sphere of impact being even in the cyber physical, because now we are, we're talking about cyber physical systems. We're talking about systems that are affecting not just our virtual uh, lives, we're now also talking about systems that are affecting our uh, physical uh, realities. And, and of course, you can look at this from a personal level, but also national and international uh, uh, level. So one in 177,000, that's the profession uh, uh, ratio we have to the dependent ratio. And also, uh, we are saying that generally, this is a global issue. So for me, I, I reflect on, uh, so in our report back in 2019, we also looked at what programs are there. Uh, are the universities contributing? Sorry. Are the universities contributing in bridging, in bridging uh, this cybersecurity skills gap? Because we're talking about it from a supply and demand. Uh, so from a supply perspective, are we preparing cybersecurity professionals? Because the demand clearly is there. But guess what? Um, we did a small uh, study uh, last year and we realized there's also a matching problem. So it's not just a supply and a demand problem, there's also a matching problem. And of course, uh, one of the things I'm really proud about is that we got some funding and we'll be uh, kicking off a project. Uh, it's in its inception phase right now. We'll be kicking off this project next year uh, to just basically bridge this gap. Uh, on creating and creating, uh, addressing the supply demand, but also matching uh, and trying to fill in a gap of 2000 cybersecurity field, uh, uh, jobs uh, within the next three years. Um, but uh, I mean, there's a lot that we can talk about here, but I, I really think that there's an issue there in terms of the cybersecurity skill gap. Which degree programs, if you went and looked, one of the things maybe I'd challenge the team that's preparing the brief is just go to the CUE website and download the accredited programs. Let's see how many are actually filling in uh, the supply side. How many programs are actually, because uh, we want to also say this is an area of specialization. So how many actually uh, in the area of cybersecurity? 
uh, how many programs or maybe the 4,000, 5,000 programs offered in Kenya? What's the ratio? I think when we checked in 2019, it was zero point, uh, let me just check, 0.2%, you know? And also we were saying maybe uh, the number of graduates, uh, you know, what's the number of graduates that we're getting vis-a-vis -vis the demand in the market. But also not just the degree programs, what are the certifications that any uh, any person who maybe started in a different area and is now focused on cybersecurity, which certifications are easily accessible and ready be, readily available uh, within the market? Uh, what is even the cost? Are they affordable? If you're thinking about people who are in machinani, uh, in the you know they say this in the uh, the situation on the ground is different right so like when you look at guys uh, back back in the rural areas and in the marginalized counties maybe not just Nairobi uh, how how accessible are some of these options uh, for career uh, growth uh, for them uh, so also just um, yes your time. yeah so let me conclude um, I also wanted to say that this is also an issue that is of a multi-stakeholder nature nature because we also need to think about it from uh, not just uh, techie jobs. Remember, there is also legislation. You know, uh, are we growing lawyers uh, in this space, not for just for Kenyan law, but international law and how it relates to cybersecurity, law enforcement, uh, civil society, uh, you know, academia, research. Because uh, again, also you need the private sector. When you talk about critical infrastructure, you know, you realize the government doesn't really operate the critical infrastructure. Majority of the critical infrastructure is run by private organizations. Uh, a lot of the money transfer services, a lot of the interbank switching, you know, those are not run by governments. So, um, so some of this, we also need to th really think about them from a multi-stakeholder perspective, because maybe the key players are outside government. Um, but also just in terms of being able to promote standards, you know, creating standards and promoting them, that also needs uh, people who are stakeholders in different uh, areas. Uh, let me go to the la last point that I wanted to highlight, uh, the behavior change. And I think we touch on this uh, in people issues a lot uh, with regards to cyber hygiene practices. And, you know, we, we, in a sense, the first thing you want to do is do the cyber security skills, training and awareness. But in majority of cases, even when people really know what they need to do, uh, do they really do it? You know, that's a big question. Uh, even one of the greatest teachers that lived uh, said, uh, whoever hears my words and puts them into practice is the wise man, is like a wise man who put their, built their house of the rock. Um, and then, you know, like uh, we, we say that, um, when you go for, you know, when you have an issue to do with your health and you go to see the doctor, sometimes they just tell you things that you already know, right? It's just the action of putting into practice that that is that is uh, that is that you're failing in. I think we can relate to this with regards to our health, with regards to our finances, with regards to our relationships. Many cases we already know what we need to do. It's just about doing it. But I just want to just uh, you know uh, highlight behavior change even from a cultural context, uh, because you know, it's not enough just to prescribe what needs to be done. There needs to also be uh, you know, an enabling environment and also a social context that enables that behavior change. Um, and I think also um, you know, just uh, figuring out ways of integrating uh, what needs to be done, not making it like a, a different thing that people need to do, just integrating uh, cybersecurity hygiene practices with the routine work that people do. Because if you increase the cost of adopting a secure practice, the less likely users are to use it, right? Of course, there's a framework I could talk about, but I think the time is not enough uh, in terms of how you drive behavior change. But of course, you want to look at it from uh, whether people have really seen the need for it, the vulnerability, they've seen that there's need to, pre to, 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 to protect themselves, they really have to see it for themselves. Uh, but also you need to lower the cost of responding, right? Uh, and make it as easy and you, you make it as, as, as easy it is as it is for them to really transition uh, into behavior change. So thank you, Victor. I know the time was tight, but I hope I've been able to touch on some of these things uh, and I'll, I'll be open to uh, further discussion and interaction. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari. That's a very, very illuminating um, presentation. I felt like I was back in, in class uh, to hear about you know, very, very important things, like you're saying, values. Um, and, and, and you know, we have documented the values in the constitution, but it's not you know, trans, translating that into practice and doing those simple things, as you say, uh, when you talk about cyber hygiene, it's like washing hands before eating. We must encourage people um, to wash their hands uh, as you know, as they use their computers. What are those hygiene practices that they need to normalize, uh, as opposed to looking at them as if they're still some foreign things, uh, you know? And of course, investing in skills and capacity, and you know, very nice suggestion about just looking at what are those courses and who is who is actually uh, studying them to build that capacity. So thank you very much. Uh, for those remarks and anybody who have any questions, observations or comments on the presentation, please uh, use the comment section in the chat. Uh, we'll have uh, opening our question section uh, after the round of presentations. The hashtag is CyberSecKE for those who are tweeting. And I'd like to invite uh, the next presenter who is Mudeo um, Kimil uh, to talk about the importance of partnerships. I know uh, Dr. Musuva mentioned something about the multi-stakeholder approach. So uh, please, you have um, seven minutes um, for your presentation. Uh, Karibu, um, Motel. Okay, great. Um, you, uh, Victor, you're saying I'm going to talk about partnerships. I've also been told to prepare on people and cyber hygiene, but I will be able to slip in partnerships into my talk, no worries. As I say, this is an area I'm passionate about. So, um, when we're going into, I'll just add on to what Paula has said, um, and now I'm taking you to class for real, <laughs> Victor. Uh, when, 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 uh, when what Paula has said about the human factor and cyber hygiene being very important, one thing we need to realize is that when it comes to anything to do with cybersecurity and cyber hygiene, um, the human factor contributes 95% to all the cyber breaches we have. You know, we've got big tech guys like IBM who've done studies to prove this. But once again, people can only defend themselves when they know what it is that they, are, that, that they need to protect themselves from or when they know what cyber hygiene entails. You know, it's not just a fancy word that we are throwing out. We need to build the capacity and the awareness. And just to go back um, historically, when we developed our strategy, um, we only had 11.6 million internet users. But between June, April to June this year, we now have 46.7 million internet users. And during that same period, we had 38.78 million cyber threats detected. And these are the ones where CCK has sensors to our critical infrastructure. So that's where they're drawing these statistics from. It's not a holistic view of the actual attacks in the country. And remember, 95% of these are human factor. So um, we need to get out to um, train our people and create awareness. And this is what the strategy had looked at. And now you, even when Mr. Nzano was speaking, he was talking about the ICT strategy. You know, we've also got um, NC4, which has been operationalized. So hopefully we're going to see a lot more proactiveness um, with a multi-stakeholder approach coming up as we develop our next strategy. But um, even having said that, we, we've, we've achieved a lot um, in the year since we first developed our first strategy. Um, we've done a lot of trainings and awareness campaigns, and I'm going to go into them in a little bit with from uh, the partnerships we've done them with. Um, We've also created a lot of personal awareness as regards data protection and privacy rights. You know, as Mr. Zano talked about how we now have our Data Protection Act, we have a data commissioner in office and they release their uh, strategic plan for the next three years where capacity building and campaign awareness plays a pivotal role. And then um, we've also, um, the strategy, the 2014 strategy also looked at promoting cyber hygiene awareness via the adoption and regulation of secure business practices, um, first giving priority to critical infrastructure. And this is because cybersecurity is very expensive, very expensive to maintain, very expensive to build capacity on. So we have to begin with critical infrastructure. And that's why k sensors initially are connected to what is critical infrastructure. But now also with the opera, opera, oh, 
when we've operationalized our date, our NC4, um, I'm sure they're going to appoint their director soon, who will be able to designate more critical infrastructure. As Honorable Kisan was talking about, you know, fiber being deemed critical infrastructure as necessary to our existence as breathing oxygen. Um, and then the strategy also looked at encouraging um, industries and regulators to jointly develop and agree on industry specific cybersecurity standards. And there's been a lot of this happening, um, like central bank has issued their regulations to the industry, KCERT has issued guideline, uh, guidelines and practice notes, so has the ICT authority. Um, so when the last roundtable um, picked an attack in 2019, as regards people and cyber hygiene, we noticed that we lacked insufficient uh, investigation capacity, prosecutorial capacity, judicial capacity, and trained law enforcement agencies. Between then and now, we had COVID. COVID wasn't just a um, health pandemic. It, it enhanced digital transformation. You know, uh, Paula just mentioned how it took us seven to eight years ahead. But with all this digital transformation, it also raised the levels of um, cyber crime and cybersecurity uh, incidents, the cyber breaches occurring uh, more and more. In fact, there's um, the IB IBM and the Ponemon Institute, they normally come together to do an annual cost of a breach uh, a report, which they issue, I think, every July or August. And in this year's report, they say because of COVID, the average the average breach, which was predominantly due to compromised credentials, um, was the highest in 17 years. And these compromised credentials, it's human factor and lack of cyber hygiene. So this is why we need to partner with everybody we can to educate the people on this. And these breaches are really ex expensive. Just to give you an example, if a breach takes um, over 200 days um, to, be, to be identified, and contained, a breach like that will cost you on average per breach $4.87 million. Uh, so these breaches are really expensive. And remember, 95% are due to human factor and lack of cyber hygiene awareness. We also have, um, we also have a few outdated laws and policies still in place. Um, I think we've, as much as we've got our computer crimes and Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act and the Data Protection Act. There's also need to enhance our Penal Code and our Evidence Act um, to embrace the new sphere that is technology law. And then the strategy. Um, I'm sure, I'm hoping and praying that now we have NC4 in place and we we've we've had the ICT plan uh, released last year that we're going to move forward really fast to create a new a new strategy. The rest of the issues which were in weak internal security practices, this is once again because of lack of awareness. But there's one here I want to highlight, and it's something which we need to look at um, more because I'm kind of miffed that in 2021, we have government agencies who collect citizens' information still using um, HTTP as opposed to HTTPS. There's an example last week when they launched Kazimtani. Some cyber savvy people were questioning, is that a legit site? So um, we need to enhance um, the standards, especially in government institutions. And the coordination amongst the various stakeholders, it's better than it was, but we still have ways to go. Um, so where are we now in 2021? And this is now where I'm going to combine the people and the partnerships. KCERT, um, as our nation's uh, public fully fledged cyber incident um, response organization has actually done a lot, you know. Um, every day they issue over 200 advisories, which is now creating awareness to the critical infrastructure people of what's out there and how to secure themselves. Please let's also remember that the 38 million attacks are from critical infrastructure. So the rest of us, we are, if we were to add those numbers, they're really, they really, really high. But um, KSET is doing a lot. Um, they also, like I mentioned, got their sensors plugged into the critical infrastructure. And they also do a lot of informal and formal meetings and information sharing mechanisms. They're actually linked to over 57 other national certs. Um, they do a lot of training. I love the fact that they've gone into the counties to do cyber boot clinics. And um, they've also launched an app, um, I think in May this year, 
uh, which is in that picture there, they've got a case of app available on both Google and, and, and uh, for Android and Apple. And I love this innovation of realizing that people are not going to send reports via an email, but our environment, we've embraced digital transformation so much that it's easier to take a snapshot or something, a screenshot, and upload it on an app and send it to KSET. So hopefully this will enhance um, more reports coming in. And um, they've also, to enhance capacity, um, they've um, launched a pilot project, which is a cyber boot camp, which they've partnered with 10 universities, wherefore they've taken five students from each university, where for eight weeks they're going to train them. So um, a lot more still needs to be done, but KSET is doing so much with what they have. What we need to do going forward is also to enhance their budgets because cybersecurity is a national security concern. You know, the financial ruin, these breaches can cause financial ruin to our, to our nation. So we need to create awareness. Everybody from Mamamboga to the president of the republic to the CEO, everybody needs to be aware. The same way Safaricom came up with that lovely ad, Piniako Siriako, it need, you need to be aware when I log on, I am a danger. What is the danger? What do I look on? Because 95% of breaches are from us humans. The ICT authority have also issued cyber hygiene guidelines when we went into remote working for their government um, workers, which is fantastic. But once again, having all these policies in paper without practically showing people what they, what they pertain is now the challenge we need to overcome in the next three years as we're planning to create more awareness. You know, these little videos that KSAT does, we need to share them everywhere. Um, Paula talked about the universities and training facilities. You know, there's USIU, there's Strathmore. Strathmore even has an executive program where you can go and do a cyberspace and strategic uh, studies program. And then we've got the advocacy and awareness platforms, kind of like what Kiktonet are hosting us to today. Um, CIO Africa are also very big on this. There's a lot of that happening now. So we, have, we, we are doing well, but we need to do a lot better. And then the government um, is also prioritizing cybersecurity um, issues. You can see, as Ms. Nzano uh, mentioned earlier, there was a launch of NC4. And now with the launch of NC4, one of their mandates is to develop framework for trainings on matters of cybersecurity and also how to detect and mitigate cyber crimes. So by creating this awareness and teaching people, hopefully we're going to re reduce um, the challenges we're facing now. But let's not think these challenges are just for Africa alone. They're on the global stage, you know. It's happening everywhere. If you find that the, the US National Security Agency was hacked, so um, cybersecurity is a challenge for everybody. Now, when, when I looked at the Kiktonet policy um, paper, and I was looking at the challenges that were highlighted that um, Kenya faced in you know, As you summarize. Yeah. As, as you okay, yeah. So just winding up. So you can see the challenges we had in 2019 versus now are all predominantly human human factor, human factor and lack of awareness of cyber hygiene, you know, all these breaches. And with 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 a, with a virus, as much as it enhanced digital transformation, it also brought us a lot more cyber criminals. And so as I wind up, it's to show you that these cyber criminals are now focusing on us in Africa, because our infrastructure, our systems, our awareness are not uh, as enhanced as the West. And in fact, Kenya has had the second most cyber attacks in um, Africa after South Africa, and not by much. Huh? And so as we're looking at developing our next strategy, looking at having further discussions, when it comes to cyber hygiene, people and partnerships, we all need to push um, what I deem nine main points that need to become everybody's bread and butter, especially as we're remote working. People need to be told how to secure their endpoint security. You know, we need to do more campaigns on this. Encrypt their files, you know, use the multi-factor authentications. Don't access free Wi-Fi spots. You know, that's where the cyber criminals are. Um, if you're operating away from an unsecured um, network, are you using your VPN? So it's one thing to have all these things in policies, but um, KSET has some awesome videos and I encourage you guys to all log on and see them. Amazing videos you can even share with your kids to show you why you don't need to be doing these things. 
Um, but finally, as much as we're talking about all these technology savvy things that we need to bring awareness to, let's not forget traditional things. As you're all working out there, let's also remind our people that they need to shred confidential information. You don't just throw it in your bin with your kitchen taka taka as kawaida and be aware of your surroundings. Don't go out there and have meetings um, where you don't know who's sitting next to you in your coffee shop and you're talking about sensitive information. So moving forward, we need to have a lot more partnerships, which we've done. We know Kenya has partnered with a lot of um, regional um, and international organizations, regional governments, um, interna uh, international governments to build capacity. Um, so well done to us, and, but let's enhance this moving forward. Asante Ali. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mudeo. That was a very, very illuminating um, presentation. Um, I, I, I agree with you on increasing the budgets, uh, creating more awareness, uh, of course, implementing the guidelines and noting the comments on uh, infrastructure. And of course, those nine points, uh, we look forward to sharing that presentation with us. Um, for, for those who are joining us now, please continue to introduce yourself. The hashtag is CyberSecKD. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, uh, who is Philip Irode, to make his presentation in the next seven minutes. Um, I also note that you are um, quite ambitious to try and have this very important, um, important discussion <laughs> in two hours. Yet there's really, really so much um, to be to be discussed, and I would beg your indulgence of all those who are participating to allow us. Uh, 15 more minutes towards the end so that we are able to hear uh, the remaining uh, panelists. So uh, without much further ado, uh, Mr. Irode, please uh, make your presentation. Let's try and uh, keep to the seven minutes. Uh, thank you, and Karibu. Thank you so very much, uh, Victor. I believe we can all see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, fine. So I'll uh, directly uh, go to uh, the areas of uh, discussion, which is basically to look into how we can uh, bounce back better from the pandemic. And then, of course, try to understand uh, the impact that uh, COVID has uh, had on us. And from a cybersecurity perspective, what has been the implications? Um, at a greater scale, when we look at uh, COVID and uh, from a national perspective, we realized that there was actually an increase uh, an increased uh, risk for people who are working from home. And this cannot be delayed as government. We actually had to make a directive and uh, issue some guidelines on actually how this was going to be done. Uh, number two, there was a uh, you know, delay in how cyber attacks were being uh, responded to because people are working remotely. And given that some of the, you know, uh, the workforce, the officers, have limited connectivity from where they are, you find that uh, the issue of responding to these uh, incidents became laggard. And then of course, uh, exposed physical security. We are talking about staff that uh, are basically working from either you call them Seba Cafe or uh, coffee joints and actually working within government systems. So the aspect of their, you know, security with what they were doing also became uh, impacted. And of course, even what you could call basic attackery, where uh, someone could actually be robbed of their laptop or they're committing with their device and they are robbed. So that became also uh, an issue. Um, the COVID uh, pandemic also resulted to what I call um, influx of criminals. And this is basically, uh, due to the loss of life, loss of uh, livelihood, where you find that uh, um, staff who were laid down were actually not uh, able to continue uh, within their jobs. And therefore, they opt to other unethical ways of uh, earning a living, whether based on their technical skills that they have. Um, the last thing we had realignment in how organization handle uh, pandemics. And then this basically means that the aspect of business continuity needs to future, I, I mean, to include the aspects of uh, cyber, sec uh, cyber security to address pandemics. This is going, it has actually taught organizations a lesson whereby 
cyber security needs to be part and parcel of the BCP plans. And therefore, organizations need to have what are called uh, virtual private uh, networks where staff who are actually essential can work from home, provide those essential services to these organizations. Um, what, what did these teach us as a community and as practitioners? We need to actually uh, increase the aspects of our cybersecurity initiatives so that we are actually able to, um, you know, to be um, capable of handling risks, cybersecurity risks when they do happen. And then, of course, we need to manage them responsibly. Uh, it was uh, notable that uh, cybersecurity officers did not have technologies to address working from home um, environment. And that is where you find there was a lot of efforts towards uh, buying solutions that can actually enable working from home um, uh, situations. And then uh, we need to also make sure that our organizations are agile. Some of the critical services that uh, government and even private sector institutions had were not set up to work on the aspect of uh, remote working. So there was a lot of uh, panel beating, uh, fabricating of systems and the provision of technologies to address uh, issues of uh, working from home, so, you know, in, in uh, compliance to the government regulations on, uh, on uh, addressing the pandemic. Um, then we also, I realized that uh, as government, we, there was the aspect of uh, how do we, you know, address issues of uh, critical services. You realize that uh, during the pandemic, there was issue of how do we as a government mobilize issues of uh, um, the safety clothing, the masks, there was an issue of how do we ensure this local manufacture of uh, the hygiene wear, the masks, the, um, even the COVID uh, vaccinations themselves. So how as government, how as a government do we bring in the aspect of uh, ensuring that we have uh, a fillers towards our supply chain and we can actually be able to uh, get this addressed. Now, going forward, what do we think that uh, we are going to do in regards to cybersecurity? We realize that this is actually a cross-cutting issue and it has a lot of impact on how we are going to address our digital economy blueprint. It has an impact on how we are going to provide digitization. So it needs to be uh, addressed clearly from a national perspective. We ensure that we have clear policies, clear strategies that will ensure that we have a multi-stakeholder engagement that provides uh, initiatives towards this. And what are we doing about it? We, we're looking at outcomes that will bring in a very more coherent cybersecurity uh, posture for the country, for the digitization initiative that we have towards our services. And just to mention, we are looking at a strong information security uh, legislative framework where we are able to enhance our country's cyber policy to address current and emerging issues. What do we do about this? You remember we have Honorable Kisang who has spoken about the um, critical infrastructure bill. We need to have this passed so that we can clearly protect our infrastructure that provides for us the hosting environment of these solutions. We are talking of uh, an enhanced uh, um, capacity and capability in information security enforcement. How do we do this? We need to continuously provide input and of course, um, legal policy where we find that there are gaps. How are they going to be addressed so that we have what we call accountability responsibility across all stakeholders within the cyberspace uh, area within our country. Then of course, we are looking at probably from a government perspective, is it important for us to incorporate information security as part of government performance contracting? This has been done and of course, from a government perspective, there is always the issue of ISMS being cascaded to all government institutions. It is important for us to have this addressed from that high level where it is part and parcel of our 
um, our performance contracting as government officers, as public sector and the like. I remember there was uh, a, a presenter who talked about uh, the penal code. How do we bring in the judiciary? How do we bring in the legal uh, prosecution agencies to be able to handle issues to do with cyber security? That needs to be strengthened. And all this is actually about the legislative framework. Then when you look at uh, uh, item number two, which is an enhanced information security and cyber security governance and management for the public sector and of course government agencies. How are we looking at team of cyber security assessment is done so that the issues of identifying even what are these critical infrastructures, we are able to map them out. We are able to identify them out such that if there is an incident, we are actually able to uh, uh, map that uh, infrastructure and look at the impact it's going to have on our economy, on our citizenry, and on our people. Um, we are looking at uh, developing procedures. How do we respond to incidences? We now have what, what we are referring to as the National Cyber Crimes Coordination Committee. How do we bring in and leverage all our stakeholders so that we are able to address issues of cybersecurity incidences? And then of course, from a technology perspective, we need to provide what I uh, refer to as a resilient and secure digital infrastructure where we try and implement what are called zero trust, because as the ICT authority, we actually are the custodian of the government uh, central core network, GCCN, the NOPD, the emails, the applications. We can't deliver issues where we, uh, I mean, instances where we've had uh, breaches on our infrastructure. So how do we provide a layered security for these infrastructures so that even the citizenry are assured of the services that are being provided within uh, this infrastructure. It is through implementation of what I would call zero trust so that we bring in layers of security to safeguard this infrastructure. And then of course, there is the um, aspect of uh, monitoring and evaluation. Security is a continuous process. So we need to provide all those um, monitoring and give feedback to uh, the multi uh, stakeholders involved and who are the custodians of uh, some of those uh, critical infrastructure. As one of the uh, um, presenters mentioned, public sector doesn't have most of the critical infrastructure. Some of them are in the hands of the private sector. So how do we ensure that they are safeguarded? The impact of a cyber breach on this infrastructure will be catastrophic to the economy. And we've seen areas where actually um, an outage of a critical service has created a rebellion and that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, thirdly, we have the aspect of uh, enhancing capacity and capacity building. I think this has been mentioned and it is important we build a pipeline of uh, um, training with, for people with technical skills, people who can be able to look at uh, technology, the business side, the service delivery, and provide remediation, provide controls that safeguard these, um, these infrastructures. And then of course, lastly, we are looking at building national and international collaboration. You realize cybersecurity, is a multi-stakeholder engagement. Where do we bring in our, uh, what I'll call our stakeholders, the private sector, the academia, the, um, the global partnerships, such that we are able to provide a holistic view of the cyber security. And of course, through information sharing, we are able to understand our posture as a country and how do we uh, provide partnership with our global partners. Um, those are some of the areas that we are looking at to be able to um, look into so that we are able to provide uh, an assurance that uh, the infrastructure and the services that we hold to the citizenry is actually a secured digital 
infrastructure. Thank you, Victor. I can want to summarize uh, of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. That was very, very uh, illuminating um, presentation, uh, highlighting some of the key aspects, the security risks that you know are important to consider. And you know, it's interesting that you talk about performance contracting and you know cyber issues. Uh, you know, developing the procedures. Uh, this is zero trust that you speak about, and of course, evaluating uh, progress and achievement, and again, capacity issues uh, coming up. Uh, you know, in terms of what needs to be done and the need for collaboration. I can see the hands there, uh, showing that actually it is everybody's. Uh, responsibility to ensure that we have this um, safe and secure cyberspace. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, also just to note um, for the presenters and panelists that there are a number of questions, including for you, Philip, please go through the chat. Um, I can see some uh, questions around um, uh, from, you know, uh, Julius Njiraini asking about the Computer Misuse Act. There's a question around conducting ICT security audits. Um, there's a question by Charles around, um, you know, cyber hygiene, um, and of course, um, you know, many other present, many other people asking about the NC4. I can see Mwendo um, uh talking about it. So please go through the chat and help us respond to some of those questions, either directed towards you, but also just contributing to um, their conversation. Um, last but not least, we'd have um, uh, Dr. Catherine Gitao. Um, the CEO for the next two weeks of Victor, uh, of Victor uh, to make a presentation. Uh, Dr. Karibu Sana, um, we'd happy to hear you. I can see you've already started intervening uh, in the comment section. Uh, please, uh, you have the next seven minutes for your presentation. And then finally, we shall have um, uh, Dr. Koyabi to wrap it up for us. So um, Dr. Gitao Karibu. Uh, Asante Sana, I'll try to actually keep to my seven minutes. I've been trying to edit my presentation. Um, so um, I was really almost asked to uh, wrap it up, but maybe as an elder uh, for much longer than two weeks, Victor, uh, I think I'm allowed to still pontificate uh, on various issues. Uh, um, so um, I think Zano said building back better. So I think the first thing that uh, we need to do with our cybersecurity, cyber hygiene is to prioritize it. Um, I'm very grateful in Kenya that the first cybersecurity strategy was actually launched by His Excellency, the President Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, and that showed a high degree of championship. Uh, however, it's easy to drop the ball when it comes to um, these issues because they are very virtual. I think one of the reasons why we uh, don't follow it as individuals as we should is that it is not a visible threat uh, the way uh, road traffic accidents or thieves breaking into your house. Uh, the threat is very clear and physical but something happening on my phone in the background, uh, I will only notice it when it has a visible result such as I try to access my address book and I find that uh, it is locked or something like that. So um, how do we get uh, this level of prioritization, uh, which is not lip service, it is real? One, I think we need to have a very accurate measure of ICT's contribution, uh, both its direct contribution to uh, GDP, for example, but also its contribution as an enabler to other sectors, which has become very evident uh, during the COVID uh, epidemic. A lot of business only went on uh, because of the existing ICT infrastructure and applications in Kenya. And uh, I think uh, the ICT sector really should be applauded, both the public sector and the private sector, uh, for how they have um, really used this technology 
uh, both to build the economy, but also to enable other sectors. So I would challenge everybody here, civil society, Kiktanet, academia, and so on, uh, to come up with a much more comprehensive tool of enabling us to measure accurately and in a way that uh, Wanjiko can understand the contribution that ICT has uh, to the well being of Kenyans. Um, the second thing I'd say is the second thing we need to um, really have a good measure of is the risk. So, a risk assessment of what the real threats are, uh, not only at the individual level to help us change our behavior, as uh, Paula referred to, uh, but also uh, in terms of government, what is the risk? What could happen? if there was a major uh, cyber attack. Uh, all policymakers need a very good understanding uh, of that threat. Uh, what about the private sector? Of course, we have the financial sector and the telcos who are very exposed. Um, and I think they already know what a hit it would do uh, both to their business and their reputation uh, if the cyber risk became real. Uh, but there are many others, even the SMEs, the MSMEs, and so on. Uh, everybody needs to have a fairly good understanding of uh, what their, risk, their cyber risk is in a way that they can understand. And the third uh, thing that is going to be very important towards the prioritization of uh, cyber security and cyber hygiene is an understanding of our current status. And I thank Zano and Modeo very much for uh, the summary they've given us and also uh, Philip Irode of uh, what has been done and what is in the near pipeline. Uh, but uh, I would urge that we start using some of the instruments that are available globally, because one thing we haven't really uh, discussed at depth in this meeting is that uh, this is not, uh, you know, this thing crosses boundaries. Yeah, so it's not only about Kenya, but it's also Kenya and the region, Kenya and the African um, region, Kenya and the world, uh, if we're really going to be protected and um, both through hygiene and security measures. So we can use uh, the, the Cambridge uh, Maturity Index, we can use the, um, tool that has been created by the United Nations Group of Government uh, Experts uh, to measure where Kenya is on the ladder of uh, cybersecurity and cyber hygiene success. Uh, I know sometimes it's a sensitive area where we don't want to um, uh, just expose our weaknesses, but we can adopt um, instruments we can choose what kind of a process and what we're going to disclose or not, but it's really important that we, we measure ourselves and we know where we are uh, when it comes to mitigating these very important uh, risks. Uh, ICT authority also has uh, an ICTA uh, policy on uh, information security and so on. So we've done a lot of work. It's time to use it and uh, use it to help the champions and the leaders who are interested in this area to truly uh, champion it and make it a number one priority in our country, given how much economic, social, and political exposure we have through this realm. And I think uh, Martin Koyabe has already given us uh, some idea of some of the major areas where we are perceiving risk. The second area is strategization. And I think everybody has pointed out that the strategies have expired. It's bad, but it's also a good thing because now we'll be strategizing post COVID when the landscape has clearly changed. So it's late, but it's not too late. And there are actually some advantages to uh, uh, the fact that we are strategizing now. We've learned a lot. We've seen uh, the risks. Uh, we have a higher population that is using um, this uh, technology. Uh, we have new applications, which we, you know, were not even present uh, at the end of the last strategy. So this is a good time to do the work of strategization. 
by setting national goals, by setting national targets, and by uh, choosing performance indicators and uh, ways of measuring. I'm very happy that we've set up a governance uh, mechanism because now the next uh, very important thing, my third thing, so I've talked about um, prioritization, strategization, now implementation. So the governance is important because we've all uh, perceived that this is a multi-stakeholder effort. Uh, so we can't just create one organization that sticks in one sector. We have to create a governance organ that is able to coherently bring together multi-sectoral efforts uh, towards uh, solving this uh, problem. Um, then institutionalization, so correctly choosing which institutions should uh, do what. And I think I saw Charles Juma's question, I've tried to respond very briefly, but I think cyber hygiene is about what you and me and all, every ordinary citizen does. You don't have to convince Kenyans in the physical realm to um, fit burglar proofing on their house or to have a fence and a gate. I don't like those things, but clearly in our environment, this is what the citizen feels they need to do to secure themselves. But I don't uh, expect them to learn Taekwondo and Karate and how to disarm somebody with a gun. That is in inappropriate uh, to ask the citizen to do such a thing. And yet sometimes I feel as if in the area of cyber hygiene and cyber security, we have not separated what we can fairly expect of every user and what really should be left to the professionals and those with the mandate and the authority to do certain more uh, drastic uh, measures. And that's why we call the police. You can actually even, I believe, uh, get into trouble if you um, harm a burglar in your house uh, because uh, in a way it's not really your job to sh uh, be the judge and jury and shoot the person dead unless they're threatening your life. So please let us separate cyber hygiene and cyber security just for the purposes of defining who does it. And then uh, we choose the right institutions to um, teach about cyber hygiene and uh, help people to have uh, cyber hygiene behaviors. And then we choose the right institution or institutions to do uh, the cyber security aspects. Now, the last area is um, of my implementation is of course, um, the monitoring evaluation review and learning. So um, if we choose our KPIs very well, uh, then we will also choose institutions, including civil society institutions such as Kiktanet, to regularly report so that uh, both Wanjiko and the champions know where we are and what else we need to do. Um, capacity building is very important, but I won't go into it in terms of, um, because Paula has spoken very eloquently and very well and made it very clear. But in the area of values, um, I think having our 10 commandments, which it's easy for us to understand so that you don't have to um, judge every action. People can actually judge themselves uh, because uh, they have a simple set of rules uh, that covers uh, most situations, uh, that kind of capacity building. And even for COVID, we are just told wash your hands, stay one and a half meters from people. That's things we can easily understand and, and uh, perform. And I understand that uh, the hand washing and the distancing and the masking and so on has had very positive health outcomes on other diseases as well. So uh, really uh, somebody has to come up with clear, uh, simple rules that everybody can understand and implement without much difficulty. And it becomes a very standard part of their everyday behavior when they're using uh, technology. The last thing I'll say is everyone has a role government, private sector, academia, civil society, and individuals. 
uh, help us all to clearly map out what our role is uh, so that the implementation can start um, immediately. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't gone too much over my seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari. We really appreciate those very useful insights. I like the part you say <clears throat> that you don't have to convince Kenyans uh, to put uh, you know, grills on their windows or, or gates or fences. Uh, it's something we do. And uh, what we need to do, like you say, prioritize cybersecurity, um, institutionalize, uh, strategize, implement, you know, monitor, and also educate the public about uh, cyber hygiene then becomes very, very important. Um, and, you know, those are very, very useful um, ideas. I'm sure uh, everybody in the room is um, excited and happy to be in this uh, melting pot of ideas. Uh, keep on tweeting, uh, the hashtag is cybersecke. Um, there are discussions and questions in the chat and urge um, all the presenters to have a look. Um, as we conclude, we note that it is um, 12. Uh, we are hoping to end now, but um, we still have one last presentation. So I ask for your indulgence for another 15 minutes since we started a bit late to, um, uh, to the presentation. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Koyabi, uh, you have your seven minutes. I see Dr. Musuva wants to leave. Maybe you can uh, say one last word before you leave, uh, Dr. Tari. And then we have, uh, uh, we will we'll have Dr. Payambi immediately after. Just one last one minute, just to. Yeah. Uh, I'm, one I'm last so word. sorry. I didn't even think you'd announce it. Uh, I was ready to just sleep away quietly. I thought it would be possible on, on virtual forums uh, as opposed to physical forums. Well, uh, Victor, thank you for giving me an opportunity just to uh, say my closing remarks. Sorry, I have another um, presentation at 12. Um, I think. Um, I don't even know what to say, Prof. Uh, Dr. Getao has just really adequately uh, summarized some of the things. I was even taking notes uh, very uh, keen and attentively. Um, and I think maybe what I'd just add is, uh, there was a question on uh, critical infrastructure. I think what I would say, there's a definition in the uh, Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Bill. And I think one of the things I learned through the OEWG, I was in the, I was one of the uh, delegates at the OEWG that concluded the 2019 to 2020, well, we finished our work uh, 2021. Um, the, the OEWG process was that it's actually transnational. We also need to think about what Dr. Getau said. When we're thinking about cyber, we just don't think about it from a localized uh, environment. Uh, even if you take an example of financial systems, uh, healthcare systems, um, you know, just uh, telecommunication systems. A lot of this will not just be localized within Kenya. Uh, so whatever approach we take really needs to have a mindset of anything disrupting us, even from outside Kenya can affect us. Uh, but I think there's already a definition on that. And I think uh, Gigi had wanted us to mention some few things about OEWG and uh, GGE. Uh, of course, Dr. Getau has been involved in the process for much longer. I know uh, Gigi had asked me to make a few remarks. Um, I, I participated because of a fellowship, uh, thank you to o OF, um, to the FCDO, uh, the UK government for the uh, Women in Cyber uh, Fellowship. Uh, and I, I would just like to say that the GGE process has been there longer. Uh, I think they've had six um, consecutive, uh, con uh, uh, it has been convened uh, for six uh, uh, periods, uh, I think since 2004. Uh, the OEWG had its first uh, mandate in 2019, June, uh, and it delivered on its work in May 2021. And a new one uh, has been started uh, as of June 2021. And I think the new one will proceed until 2025. Uh, and I think this is like a global panel where you're able to, at the UN level, engage uh, different nation states uh, on things to do with norms, uh, things to do with uh, international law and how it applies to cyberspace in terms, to, in terms of capacity building and cooperation. Uh, and I think these are also forum that, fora that uh, I think civil society, uh, private sector are also engaging um, and also trying to get to make sure that their voice is heard. And of course, this is a, a great 
uh, platform to have some of those things integrated in resolutions and commitments by governments, including the Kenya uh, government. Um, so I think with that, I'll just, uh, I thought I would quietly slip out, but uh, right. yes, I think if you would allow me, I'm sorry, I, I yes. apologize for, yeah. Thank, thank you very much for your indulgence and uh, for making that uh, closing submission and the observations about the GGE. We really appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to having you and sharing more ideas about uh, the future of cybersecurity in Kenya. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Uh, we'd like to invite the next uh, presenter, our last presenter, who is uh, Dr. Koyabe. Dr. Koyabe, um, are you ready? Um, uh, yes. Uh, yes. All so right. for, okay. Um, just before you go, I'd just like to ask the other panelists to prepare their final uh, remarks. Also, um, just look at the, the questions in the chat and please uh, respond. I can see a question to Nzano about adherence to alignment and ISMS along government institutions, or is it to uh, FIP and quite a number of other questions. Please feel free to respond. The hashtag is CyberSecKE. Uh, Dr. Rikoyabe, you have uh, five, seven minutes. Please uh, keep to the time because we have to end in a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Victor. Actually, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, most of the presenters who have come before me have touched on quite a number of issues. Uh, what I'll try to do is to maneuver my way around those issues but at the same time, add some new context into what they've just said. I'm guided by three words, and I want us to really take these words uh, in, in, in their entirety. So the first thing is that Kenya enjoys what we call goodwill. And by goodwill, I mean Kenya has a lot of friends, both in and out, who are very keen in making sure that uh, Kenya becomes what it's supposed to be. The other uh, issue is the issue of innovation. We've got a very innovative uh, population. Uh, we've got a very dynamic population. And as seen from this particular forum, you can see the enthusiasm and the number of uh, ideas that are being posted by a number of uh, my, my fellow presenters. So therefore innovation, there's no shortage. And that is something that we really need to take into context. And then the third one is the issue around us being able to be sustainable. And this word sustainability has been used and bounded in many other areas, but I think it will be very important that the thread of my presentation touches on these particular three areas as we look forward in how we can navigate the cybersecurity uh, stature in the country. So let me start by first of all addressing six issues, which I believe are very critical and they've been touched on by a number of issues, uh, and I mean a number of speakers. And the first one, and Kate really put it very uh, well, is the issue of where does the country stand in terms of the status of cybersecurity in the country? And I think that's what many of us here are trying to probe and to be able to find a way around that. So therefore, the notion that we need an assessment of some value is very important. An assessment gives you a pointer. It gives you almost similar to what you say, a map that tells you here is where you are and there is where you're supposed to be going. And this is how you can be able to chart out the way forward. So therefore, it is important that an assessment in various aspects is conducted in the country. And these assessments, there's no shortage of formulas. There's no shortage of methodologies of assessment. I think uh, Kate touched on one or two of them that are available out there. But just for the sake of being neutral, we don't want to mention what is up there. But the point is, we do have a lot of assessments that the country can use in order to measure where it is in terms of other areas. The national cybersecurity strategy becomes almost like the spine of where the strategic planning and the strategic positioning of where cybersecurity should go must be hinged on. We do have a new, what I would call a guide, for national cybersecurity strategies that are developed by the ITU. Uh, we were really uh, part of the authoring team that looked at various areas in those areas. And I think uh, Paula has touched on just one or two um, in terms of the issues of cyber norms and cyber diplomacy, which is a new area that is emerging that I would really urge that is considered as one of the areas to look at when it comes to the new strategic plan. There are also issues around the emerging technologies. And what are we doing in terms of formulating policies and regulation 
and even legal instruments that will guide us when we talk of emerging technologies, such as, for example, the artificial intelligence and IoT and the rest of it. Blockchains, for example. I know Kenya has some uh, committees of some sort where they're looking at these particular issues, but we need to have maybe more activity in that area in order to guide us going forward. So the key, as I said earlier, is the issue of assessment. Kate touched on the issue of the impact assessment, especially when it comes to risk assessment, and to assess what is the impact of cyber security? How do you measure the impact and the changes that cyber has created in the country? I think that's something that we really need to look at. The second issue which has been touched on is the issue around the infrastructure, how to protect the infrastructure, how to make the infrastructure resilient because we depend on it in various aspects. But there are a number of areas that one has to take into context. First of all, there is a need for what we call a critical infrastructure framework in the country that can enable Kenya to identify what is critical. And critical does not just mean what the, the, the typical uh, critical areas or sectors that we know of. It could also be what you consider valuable. In, in some countries, actually monuments that are very sacrosanct to the country are, are treated as critical infrastructure. It's important that we have what we call a non-list of critical infrastructure uh, sectors in the country. The European Union, for example, has 11 basic critical infrastructures. So every country knows where these particular critical infrastructures are and they can be able to formulate their way forward based on those areas. The SART in Kenya, for example, has a good, uh, as, you know, it, it has been enhanced quite well. And I know uh, Joseph Zanu and his team have done quite a bit on that area. But there's a notion that we need to look at the sectorial certs so that we can uh, enhance those areas such as banking, for example. Uh, we should also look at the academia, for example. And we should also look at the law enforcement, especially from the military position where they should have their own certs and therefore just have a dotted line between the national cert and the law enforcement side. And these are areas of how you can build the cert. And we've talked about ownership and which organization should be able to own that particular national cert. And these are things that can be enshrined into the laws that exist. This is an important component also in terms of governance and Kate touched on it, but I don't want to go into that. But the point of governance is to create what we call an orderly, uh, seamless, structure that can be able to house most of the interest when it comes to cyber issues. We talked about incidents, re, re, you know, reporting, and I think uh, Philip touched on that, or Phil touched on that particular issue in terms of how do we make sure that we are able to share information adequately and effectively without necessarily infringing what the nature of that information is. Having an information sharing framework is important. And that also goes with the data sharing framework in the country, that is important. So that departments can be able to see how to do that. Legislatively, and that is the third item, a lot of as progress has been done. We've seen the issues around the, and uh, my Joseph talked about the Cybersecurity Act. We have the Data Protection and Privacy Act. We've got the Information Commissioner's Office that has been formulated. But my question there is, what are we doing in order to abide with other conventions, such as the Convention 108, and there's now Convention 108 plus, is Kenya part of that particular convention when it comes to data, uh, I mean, data protection and privacy and other areas that we can be able to coordinate with? Because that also gives you the aspect of protecting the citizen's data when it's moving from one particular jurisdiction to the next jurisdiction. We are going to have what we call the Africa Free Trade, which has already been signed by all the nations in Africa. The question is, what are we doing continentally and regionally to make sure that we can enhance movement of information without necessarily having this restriction because we shall be having people moving from one location to the next one. So the key question there really is, what are we doing in that area? There was a, a good account in terms of the instruments of law that are being looked at the legislation at the legislative stages, but more is needed in terms of how this peg with what we have outside the country as we know it. So whenever we're looking at the strategy, whenever we are looking at how to develop these areas, we need to take that into context. Fourthly is the issue around awareness. And Paula gave a very good account of issues around workforce 
issues around development and how can we be able to build skills in these particular areas. The question I have is we need to look at the issue around, do we actually compensate our skilled labor adequately? And I'll give you an example. There have been so many issues where people are trained on specific skills, but because they are not compensated, because they're not paid handsomely as we know it, they would leave and go into other sectors. So therefore the resources that were spent training those individuals in those specialized skills are never, never fulfilled. They'll always be empty. And I can assure you that if we have a system or if we have a way of how we can be able to compensate commensurately individuals who have specialized skills, then we are bound to be able to create that sustainment that I've talked about. There's also the issue around creating loyalty. The US military is known for its very good cyber capacity. And the key issue there is that they have a very good program where they would take graduates from colleges, they would pay for them their fees, and these graduates would come in when they're young, in their early 20s, and they would work for the military at the highest level, giving them the highest input that they can. And that maintains that particular sector, which is the cybersecurity sector, to flourish because you have this revolving door that is also compensating and rewarding the loyalty that is there. And some of them stay on. But the point is you create loyalty. So therefore we need to create loyalty with institutions of higher learning. We need to create loyalty within the tertiary institutions, which are quite a number in the country, in order to have this vibrant, uh, you know, skill and, and you know, skill pool that we are looking for. Accreditation, certification is important. Someone talked about self-regulation in the, within this particular sector, but the point is we need to have a structure that can be able to identify who actually is called a cybersecurity expert and how do you be how are you able to, 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 to have these people practice? Because in some cases you might find some people might have skills that are not necessarily genuine. And we've seen that from time to time. But I don't want to touch on this issue because I'm sure there's a debate around it. There's a debate on whether we should be able to allow people to be able to register first before they practice. But the point is it can be self-regulating, but we have to look at those issues of creating a standard so that we have people who are qualified on the streets being able to practice what we are now calling cybersecurity as, a, as, a, as an entity. Uh, last but not least, we have got issues on internet standards and also issues on cybersecurity standards. My really big question here is, are we thinking of the markets that are not necessarily thought about, especially like the SME market? What are we doing? to make sure that there's a standard for the mom and girls, there's a standard for the two people in, a, in an industry, there's a standard for the cottage industry in terms of cybersecurity. We need to be able to think about those particular sectors because they contribute almost 80 or 75 to 80% of the country's GDP. So therefore they matter in the value chain, they matter. So therefore we need to make sure that we are able to look at standards in those areas as well. There is the issue of standards in terms of interoperability, of different technologies from one point to the other. That is something that we need to look at. For example, when you look at the issues of IOTs, the issues of emerging technologies, they actually open up a different vector of vulnerability when it comes to cyber. So that is important to look at going forward. I can't emphasize any more on collaboration and coordination. And, I, and Philip, I think, uh, put it very succinctly there. And of course, uh, earlier on during the opening remarks by Grace and also Victor, partly you mentioned about these issues of collaboration. We need to collaborate because cybersecurity is across borders. Collaboration just means that you look at yourself, look at the neighbors and then say, how can we collaborate in specific areas? Because that's what is needed going forward. And collaboration can be both inward looking and outward looking. And I think that's where I sit here and uh, I really want to make sure that uh, you're aware that there's also what we call the African Union and the global uh, forum on, 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 I mean, on sub expertise that we have a program where we're calling the uh, AU GFC e-collaboration pro uh, project. Uh, this project is looking at specifically enhancing cyber capacity in the 54 AU countries. We have got a program which is quite uh, involving and Kenya has been invited formally 
to participate in this particular program. I'm glad that we've already had discussion with Kicktonet and we've now uh, formally uh, written to the ministry and we hope Kenya will be able to join this particular program so that they can be able to benefit from the dividends that are going to be there. There are three specific deliveries in this particular program. The first one is to look at the assessment in terms of where the cyber capacity building status is in each of the member states. And from that, we can be able to prioritize what is of priority that requires specific attention in that member state. So for example, from this meeting, if we have an item that is of priority, that is the kind of information that we want to look for. Then thirdly, we are looking for a sustainment aspect of this particular program. That means we are getting experts from each of the countries that are participating. We've already- uh, Don't tell me as you conclude. We, we've already committed to the ministry the type of experts that they are, and they already have that particular list. And then thirdly, we are developing the modules that can be able to help uh, develop the enhancement of cybersecurity strategies and other areas of cybersecurity capability in many of the African states. But with those particular few remarks, and of course, with the opportunity both to KICTA and the sponsors of this particular forum, and of course, the panelists who have come before me, I would really want to thank you, uh, Kiktanet, for the opportunity, and thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari, for that very elaborate presentation. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've taken us through some of the very critical uh, things that need to be done. Kenya already has a goodwill, uh, you know, talking about cyber norms and, uh, sorry. The, um, you know, various aspects in terms of assessment, critical infrastructure, the role of SATs, and uh, the importance of governance, and of course, creating more awareness and what we need to do about the loyalty question and how to accredit and, you know, continue to build skills, and more importantly, uh, collaboration among stakeholders. Uh, we are really, really running out of time. So maybe I'll just ask, um, you know, uh, Grace to prepare to make the closing remarks. Uh, I think we've responded to a number of the questions in the chat section. Uh, I will kindly ask uh, Dr. Gitao to maybe um, make uh, last remarks on behalf of the panelists and then we'll have Grace and then we'll, we'll close from there. Dr. Or maybe we can have Grace. Okay, I suspect uh, Dr. Gitao is uh, muted. Let me switch on my camera. Oh, here oh, she yeah, is. she has come. She has come right. there. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Kicktonet and of course the FCDO. I can see Charles Juma is still uh, on the line. Uh, thank you very much. I think we, uh, as uh, and other presenters have said, we should have more of these uh, forums. I'm sure it's part of uh, the capacity building for every for all of us, uh, because when we hear all these uh, different viewpoints and opinions and very good information, and also to it gives us a lot of hope because you can see that we already have a lot of capacity, and there are many things that are being done. So uh, kudos to you and thank you very much. Uh, personally, I've made copious notes and I've seen there's also very good engagement on the chat and there's a lot of information that uh, has been provided there by the participants as well as the presenters. So I hope all that will be uh, followed up. Um, I think I've heard some priorities. Uh, we need to um, help the critical infrastructure bill to come forward. Um, we need to help our country to uh, continue taking a leadership role in the African region uh, by exploiting the different opportunities. And that includes the ones at ITU, the ones at the UN, the ones at the GFC and the AU. There are conventions which have uh, not been ratified by Kenya and so on. And uh, I really believe that there's a lot of quick wins which are in the pipeline um, that uh, we can take advantage of. So I'll stop there because I'm the one complaining on the chat that we've run out of time. 
but just to say thank you to everyone, uh, both the organizers, the funders, and the participants. And I think you can all give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agri. OK. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate, for summarizing. Uh, the, the, some of those key points, so we won't even summarize because of time, but I think one point that has been emphasized is on the need for um, stakeholder engagement and um, the need to embrace multi-stakeholder approaches in such conversations. Uh, and, and of course, collaboration is key. So what's the way forward? We will synthesize the conversations, the points that have emerged from this conversation, and uh, we will have a report. We will also synthesize the key areas and we will share them uh, with, uh, with ICTA and uh, because ICTA is also sitting in that committee that's reviewing the strategy, we'll also endeavor to engage with different stakeholders on areas that have been identified and are critical to them as um, you had. Um, you know, we'll also look into the report and see what needs attention, maybe from the National Assembly before the close shop next year. So we are grateful really to UK's Government Digital Access Program for this collaboration. Uh, thanks so much, Jemima, Nicole, Charles, uh, and Michael. Uh, we are also grateful to our speakers, um, Zano, Dr. Musuva, Mutheu, uh, Philip from ICTA, Dr. Catherine Gitao and uh, Dr. Koyabe. So we applaud all of you, all of you who have participated. I think um, at any point we had about 60 participants getting in and out, uh, which actually just demonstrates the, in, the, demonstrates the interest uh, in this topic. Um, and then uh, of course, um, we thank you for your information and for the great thoughts that have been shared on, on chat. I was just looking at those qu questions. They are really quality questions that uh, would, some of them would require another full round table to just uh, unpack them. So thank you so much. We will follow them. We'll take action on them. And finally, I want to thank the Kiktonet team, Mora Gishanga um, and our fellow uh, from Germany, Jonas uh, Pauli. We, we are grateful to Mwendo Kivuvo, our technical person, and of course, uh, Victor, uh, for putting this together. Uh, please, um, um, uh, let's, let's meet again when we convene another meeting. And again, I just want to say Asanteni Sana and have a wonderful day. So you're free uh, to leave uh, the round table and uh, we appreciate you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you so much, Grace and team. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Kitana team. Bye. Bye, Charles. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye. Kate. Bye, Nancy. And thank you for joining. Bye, Grace. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Grace. Bye, bye. Ciao, ciao. You owe me.